Escape from Reaper Island. Part one, Penta Runner. Every year for the last few decades, at least one spaceship left planet Earth towards an exoplanet that humanity was trying to colonize. The past 50 years were crucial in this slow but steady process of finding a new home. There were plenty of tragedies, especially in the previous century, when ships carrying millions of refugees landed on a new planet just to discover that human civilization wasn't compatible with their latest chosen planet. In one way or another, for better or for worse, every camp or colony eventually failed. There were plagues and attacks from new species of animals. There were contagious diseases and toxic elements in the air that their technology only discovered a little too late. There were natural disasters brought by their sudden invasion and civil wars between rival groups that didn't leave old grudges back on Earth. All things considered, it looked like there was a light at the end of the tunnel. The exoplanet known as Mara Magna had every quality that made it humanity's most likely candidate for a second home. Mara Magna was located on the star system 400 TC, relatively unexplored except for this one planet. It was half as far from its star as the Earth was from the Sun. It had one moon that, in turn, had two satellites of its own and exploratory robots already on the surface of each. The exoplanet was slightly smaller than planet Earth, but with a very interesting geography composed of one extremely large continent surrounded by almost countless islands and a profound ocean mysterious enough to put Earth's waters to shame. The first good signs of Mara Magna were the results of the quality of air, the water, and the soil. It was almost a perfect match with humans' requirements. This prompted a wave of exploratory robots and the very first teams of astronauts and explorers. Every result was more hopeful than the previous one. Plants were growing, native animals weren't a threat, and the first building didn't crumble at all. Soon enough, the entire Earth and every small colony on other planets had heard the good news. It became impossible to stop them from rushing the process of building a colony. In 20 years, Mara Magna's colony, built on the planet's equivalent of a valley close to the sea, was thriving. After 20 more, the colony expanded, supporting 10 smaller settlements along the coast and deeper into the continent. As of the year 2154, the most needed thing in Mara Magna's colony was more people. If the planet really stood a chance to be a home for all the people that managed to escape from Earth's hunger, wars, and contamination, then it had to grow enough to fit all of them, and fast. Naturally, it wasn't enough to bring people to live on the planet. First, it was necessary to build the structures to sustain them, harvest the food to feed them, and explore the planet to make sure it was safe. Mara Magna found itself in dire need of millions of workers and, in a move that didn't surprise the historians scattered around the universe, humanity found a way to discreetly reinvent slavery, shipping poor, unfortunate souls from Earth to perform the worst jobs at the new planet in exchange for little more than breathable air and a chance to stay in that shiny new home. In June of 2154, a spaceship by the name of Penta Runner took off from the Earth, carrying within its metallic walls about a thousand passengers more than it would be advisable. The first thousand were soldiers, following orders that took them across the universe. They were swiftly followed by about half the convicts from several prisons on the planet, unknowingly selected to work for their freedom at the least rewarding jobs on an unknown planet. A large portion of the passengers were refugees, some of the thousands out of millions of people struggling to stay alive in a world that was mostly just rubble and leftovers from the wars. Despite what it was advertised across the universe, only a minority of passengers in the Pentarunner were actual volunteers that eagerly and willingly 
wanted to leave behind everything they had ever known for whatever exciting and original adventures awaited them at Mara Magna. One of the passengers in the Penta Runner was Hayden Larson, a man that was mostly resigned about his fate. He carried himself slightly differently than the rest of the passengers. He wasn't part of the ambitious, enthusiastic, and hopeful people that daydreamed about life on Mara Magna. He wasn't somber, haunted, or willing to put up a fight against the inevitable future ahead of him. Not that the passengers had much time to get to know each other. The ship traveled for a week before everybody on the ship went through a medically induced hibernation state. This served the purpose of protecting the bodies from the effect of faster than light interstellar travel from Earth to Mara Magna, made possible through the nuclear fusion engines of the Penta Runner spaceship. Consequently, the thousands and thousands of passengers of the Penta Runner woke up a few months later, with only two weeks of travel left until they reached their destination. They were disoriented, many of them felt sick and scared, and they were impossibly far from home, family, and everything they used to know. It was to be expected that tensions were running high, and cohabitation was a challenge. At first, Hayden had promised himself to avoid befriending anyone on that ship, seeing them all as liabilities. But his calm demeanor, against his best wishes, attracted wary and frightened passengers that sheltered at his side away from the hysterical crowds. He was involuntarily chosen as some kind of protector, or guide through the length of the ship from the sleeping pods toward the food dispensers in the dining hall. He warned them against threats, answered questions, and explained their sensitive situation to the best of his abilities. You must avoid getting hurt, he advised them. That's the infirmary over there, but you would find it out of service, as it serves as a provisional jail to people adamant on protesting the inevitable. The secondary observatory is shut down as well, he announced, moving closer to the wall further away from said spot, letting whoever wanted to follow him, but not making more effort than that. The protesters are holed up in there. They blocked the entry with a couple bodies that died during our little hibernation, as proof of a failure in the entire system. It's probably best if we can't take a look outside anyway. So, the rumors are true? A young woman asked, walking as close to Hayden as possible without being an inconvenience. People are talking about bad omens, you know, meteor showers, solar flares, space debris, an abandoned satellite, unexplainable shadows, strange phenomena that always means a ship is cursed. Hayden groaned and tried his best at replying without completely snapping at the poor woman. We're in space. Everything is strange and unexplainable. Be superstitious if you want, but it doesn't make a difference. Cursed or not, our odds aren't any good to begin with. The woman nodded thoughtfully, and the small group surrounding them murmured their own theories quietly. But the woman had something else to ask. Are you a refugee too? It was a fair question. Hayden had barely given his name since he joined the Penta Runner. Nobody knew anything else about him, which was a problem in a place with such distinct social groups. The ex-convicts were nothing but trouble. The soldiers were paid prosecutors. The volunteers were privileged fools, and the refugees were desperate, unlucky bastards. Hayden merely stopped walking and announced, We're here. He had safely guided them to the dining hall one more day. More than that, they would arrive at Mara Magna later that day. The woman walked away from him with her head hung low. All of them stepped in line to the food dispensers, dreaming of better, warmer, more satisfying meals as soon as they reached their destination. It was exactly the kind of useless hope that Hayden preferred to avoid. Part 2. Mara Magna The mainland was extremely busy. The landing zone for spaceships was on flat and vast terrain between the central colony and another smaller camp. From there, the passengers of Penta Runner were taken in dozens of buses to a military base, where they, mostly obediently, 
moved through the motions of medical checks and civil registrations into the Mara Magna colony. There was no time to waste. It was assumed that they had a good night's sleep on the ship before arriving, ignoring the protests, the nightmares, the restlessness, and extreme terror that suffocated a great part of these new inhabitants of the exoplanet. As soon as the administrative processes were done, it was necessary to assign those working hands to a task. As if the rumors about slavery weren't unsettling enough, Hayden and the other thousand newcomers were about to learn a lot about their new home. The foreigners were divided into smaller groups and introduced to a handful of officials that would assign each person a specific team, task, mission, or place of work. Judging by the fact that they were already asked if they were soldiers, ex-convicts, refugees, or volunteers, it wasn't hard to guess that the selection method would be biased. Hayden's group stood under the afternoon sun and listened attentively to the man ahead of them. My name is Harrison Holman, General of the Mara Magna Army. I officially welcome you to the planet. Right now we are in the mainland, the singular continent of the planet. The center colony is two hours away from this base. There are smaller settlements along the shore, up the hills on the west, and in a couple of the closest islands. This is the mere beginning of what could become the greatest step in humanity's history. There is a lot, a lot to do on this planet. We need strong, brave, honest workers. It's up to each and every one of you to prove you deserve a place in this history-making process. You aren't changing the world. You're helping to build one. And I hope you're ready. Any specialists will be taken to their respective commissions afterward. From this group, I will assign you to one of these jobs. Exploration missions, construction work, farm work, and scientific development. Let's get started. What followed was a very interesting manifestation of rumors coming to life. It was the first time that all of them stepped onto that planet, and yet almost all of them reacted in some way or other when they were assigned their jobs. General Holman started listing off names. Charlotte Welch, Exploration, Crystal Cape. Jeffrey Salazar, Construction Work, Landing Port 2. Ty Palmer, Farm Work, Camp 11. Melanie Ngo, Scientific Development. And there was the first break in the order. The previous ones just walked over to the designated area or truck or guide in various levels of resignation. But this Milani No, a middle-aged woman that was chosen for scientific development, started screaming. All the heads turned to her, and a pair of guards immediately ran towards her to keep her from running. She was about a dozen people away from Hayden, so he was able to get a front row seat to the spectacle of her crisis. The woman cried as if there was a hungry beast about to jump at her as if a demon had crawled out from the ground and she was staring at the face of unspeakable evil. When that piercing yell ran its course, the woman tried to escape. She pushed and kicked whoever she had to just to get away from there, but there were just too many people. The guards were on her in a matter of seconds. There were too many and her desperation wasn't enough to keep them from dragging her away but they couldn't restrain her failing limbs while also covering her mouth. This meant that Hayden and every other soul around was able to hear her warnings. No, the woman cried. No, no, don't take me there. Don't take me to the labs. I want to live. I don't want to be your lab rat. Don't, don't take me to the slaughterhouse. No, no. She cried the entire time until the guards injected her with a potent sedative and carried her unconscious body to an awaiting truck with a red cross painted on the side. A tense silence fell over the group like they were standing in a graveyard at midnight, patiently waiting for the Grim Reaper to call their names. Disobedience won't be tolerated, General Harrison Holman said in a menacing tone that couldn't completely hide a hint of exhaustion in his voice. Whatever rumors you've heard from whatever corner of the universe you've come from, I recommend that you ignore them. 
As I said, we need brave and hard-working people. There's no space in Mara Magna for superstitions and petty gossip. All of these jobs assigned to you are respectable and necessary, and the sooner you embrace them, the better it'll be for all of us. Hayden listened to that man's impersonal and practical words. He held his ground and walked until another person was assigned to the laboratories. He watched as this old man fell down to his knees, crying like a little kid and begging for a second chance until the guards dragged him away. Discretion be damned, Hayden couldn't hold back his curiosity any longer. He looked around him until he spotted a familiar face and slowly made his way to the side of the woman he had met on the spaceship from Earth. Why is everybody so terrified of scientific work? He asked, looking ahead without meeting her eyes. It took the woman a moment to realize that eccentric, quiet man was really talking to her again by his own initiative. She eagerly took her opportunity to secure the friendship of that man and explained. The Mara Magna colony is still relatively young. There's too much about this planet we don't know yet, down to the composition of the very air we're breathing. It's like the scientists discovered a brand new periodic table. They have to locate, identify, name, and test all these new elements, materials, and substances, and exactly how they would affect, benefit, or harm our lives. Long story short, they need guinea pigs. Sure, it's a rumor. But why else would you pick people with no scientific background to work in a laboratory? They don't have the time to be ethical. If they don't test how a drink from every puddle of this stupid planet would react in a regular person's stomach, they are risking finding out too late when there are billions of people already living here. You think I'm exaggerating, but imagine the stories these people have heard to react like they were just sentenced to death. There has to be some truth behind all the stories, doesn't there? Hayden nodded in acknowledgement, but he couldn't offer much more than that. As cold and irritating as the general seemed, he had a point. Fighting this fate was useless. Resignation would make this process faster. It would simply make things easier for every person involved. So, Hayden waited for his name to be called, listened to all the other options, and observed the myriad of reactions. Joe Peterson, construction work, southern deck. The crowd started to grow thin. Angelica Lee, farm work, campsite seven. People continued to throw rumors around, maybe as a warning, maybe as morbid entertainment. Gene Turner, Exploration, Southern Hills. Time passed slowly. The sun slid down the unfamiliar blue of Mara Magna's sky. Carlos Perez, Exploration, Reaper Island. And finally, Hayden caught a new, interesting, even more ominous reaction. Not just from the person called out by the general, but by the entire crowd. The group gasped in unison the second they heard that name, Reaper Island. The sound of a hundred people losing their breath over the mention of a place was enough to make Hayden shiver. He turned his head this time to look at the closest thing to a friend in the eyes, and the woman instantly understood his question. Infamous place, she explained. Everyone has heard about Reaper Island, but nobody ever returns from it. It's like... She didn't manage to explain any further than that. The general was raising his voice again. Hayden Larson, exploration, Reaper Island. Just like that, Hayden's fate was sealed. With his head held high, the crowd's murmurs and hissing sounds of fear at the very name of Hayden's destination, this man from planet Earth made his way to a truck waiting to take him to the most infamous place of every planet that humanity had ever tried to colonize. Part 3. Arrival at Reaper Island Two military trucks were in charge of driving two dozen people to the northernmost deck of the main colony of Mara Magna. There, a small ship was waiting for the brave explorers, as if they had had a say in taking that insane adventure. Upon arrival at the deck, shortly after the sun went down the horizon, Hayden was presented with two small mercies that the most cynical part of him didn't want to take as comforting, but he couldn't avoid the breath of fresh air at some familiarity in the face of such hostile odds. 
Number one, the same general, Harrison Holman, was in charge of the team of explorers on their way to Reaper Island. His demeanor hadn't changed, as if he was unaware of the rumors about the lack of survivors on that dreary island. Number two, the refugee woman from the spaceship was also there, getting down from the second truck with the help of a different woman that, apparently, she had successfully befriended far faster than her attempts with Hayden. Accepting the fact that, now that he had a specific job, his survival most likely depended on their talent as a group rather than his individual abilities, Hayden put down his pride for once and approached them. Oh, hi. The first woman greeted him, searching for his name in her memory. Hayden Larson. He introduced himself properly with a handshake. Samantha Perry. She replied, pleased like a proud mother, excited like a teenage girl. This is Captain Miranda. She turned towards the other woman. You can call me Harper, the woman said, offering Hayden a firm handshake. You're also a refugee from Earth? Something like that, Hayden answered. And you are? Captain of the Mayor Magna Army, serving under General Holman's orders. I know these colonies like the back of my hand. I have 10 years and 16 exploratory missions completed on Mara Magna. She's our best bet at surviving Reaper Island, Samantha added with a smile. A second later, she turned away so a soldier would help her get up on the boat. That gave Hayden enough time to address Harper, saying, an hour ago she told me no one ever returns from Reaper Island. What changed? Everyone else looked beyond terrified, but the two of you are oddly calm. What did you tell her? And why do I suspect it was a lie? You don't look like the type that believes rumors, Harper answered. When she got tired of waiting for a reaction from Hayden, she added, The rumor itself was a lie. The general survived Reaper Island. He's the only one that's ever returned from there. And under his leadership, we will come home in a few days. You'll be wise to follow orders, not ask too many questions, and do whatever it takes to survive out there. A moment later, she was up on the boat, and soon enough, it was Hayden's turn. There was no time or place to pry for more information about the island or seemingly legendary general that would lead them into that death trap. The small ship traveled throughout the night, giving the explorers a chance for one last night of peaceful sleep. This, of course, hardly worked. Half of the passengers had never been on a boat and spent the entire time battling seasickness. People were too curious and unsettled to fall asleep. The people brought from planet Earth were exchanging theories and horrible stories they had heard about the island. Hayden debated between a full night of sleep, compiling rumors to be prepared for the worst, or finding Captain Miranda or another experienced soldier for more realistic information about their destination. Eventually, he realized the wisest option was to try to sleep. Though he did wake up early and left the bunk beds of the passengers' quarters below the deck of the ship to go take a look at the sunrise over the Mara Magna Sea. Hayden found Captain Miranda at the bow of the ship, but she wasn't alone. The general himself was standing next to her. That area of the ship was currently empty, and the two bodies at the front hadn't noticed his presence yet. Hayden walked forward slowly catching bits of a private conversation. A better plan, Harper said, at the end of an argument that Hayden had missed. We are following orders and completing the mission. That's what matters, Harrison replied. So you're not going to explain the stupid map to me? You're not going to tell me what you're hiding in your bag? Stop! Harrison hissed at her and stepped closer. He was whispering, and Hayden missed most of what he said, except for the end. Follow my orders. You can lead this group back home. Hayden was too exposed to turn back around. The best he could do was take a more purposeful and louder step, then clear his throat in greeting. Both soldiers turned around sharply to glare at him. Morning, Hayden grumbled, walking forward casually, revealing nothing of how much he did or didn't hear. He leaned against the railing of the boat, a few steps away from the officers. Good morning, Larson, the general said, stepping away from his right-hand woman to end their clandestine argument and move closer to Hayden. Admiring the view. Is that it? Hayden wondered, staring at the island ahead of them, 
which appeared closer and closer with each passing second. Reaper Island in all its infamous splendor. Harrison said, discreetly admitting that he was well aware of the location's nasty reputation. I've heard people say this is how planet Earth used to look hundreds of thousands of years ago. Look at these clean waters. You can see the island's vegetation from all the way here. It's wild and fertile, and the preliminary exploratory robots found remarkable mineral deposits. It could be a gem for the Maramagna colony, if only we can take a closer look. Hayden was well aware of his options. He could try to gain the General's trust, which could come in handy in the adventure waiting for them. He could inquire more details about the island, information that could potentially save his life. Or he could make a grave mistake and say, it's not your first time on the island? It wasn't exactly a question. Hayden knew this, the general noticed. Even the captain walked closer as if she expected some sort of altercation. It isn't, the general replied, but his face had changed. His expression closed off, and Hayden knew at once that he had lost whatever respect the other man had for him. And, if we're lucky, none of us will need to ever set foot in this place again. After his brief conversation with Hayden, the general locked himself in the pilot's cabin, and the captain was busy getting everything and everyone ready for reaching their destination. Before an hour passed, everyone on the ship was wide awake and the deck was filled with bags, which everyone helped unload on the coast of the island. Finally, getting a good, close look at Reaper Island, Hayden had to repress a shiver. He was troubled by the fact that not even he could shake off the rumors about that place. It shouldn't have been scary. It shouldn't have been intimidating. It was just a regular island. It looked just like the paintings and the pictures in the history books, something tropical even. The sand on the beach was a creamy beige color, until it intertwined with thick green grass that, after a few more feet, welcomed tall trees, the Mara Magna equivalent to palm trees, and, further in, all kinds of green, luscious plants that they would probably identify in their journey. It would have been idyllic, save for the ghost looming on the horizon, the small mountain that crowned the island, casting a heavy shadow over a side. It was a frightening mountain. It seemed completely out of place, but science hadn't finished figuring out how the myriad of islands around the mainland had even formed. The mountain was terribly steep, and it ended sharply on an insane cliff, as if it had been cut down in half by some godlike knife. The side of the cliff itself looked like a serrated knife, like the teeth of a shark, like the sacrificial weapon used to cut the head of titans. The mere sight of it felt too sharp for a simple human to witness, let alone get close to. Hayden's mind rushed with theories and intrusive thoughts. He felt impossibly convinced that more than one person had fallen down that death trap, and he felt a wave of nausea at the mausoleum that probably awaited them at the bottom of the cliff. He also tried his best to make sense of it all. He wasn't an expert or anything close to it, but he had to understand why that island had earned such a terrible reputation, how it worked, what it was made of, what was in the air he was breathing and the ground he was walking on. When the entire group was on the beach, Hayden noticed the general purposefully wasting time until the boat started its retreat on the water. As soon as the ship was moving, the general shifted gears, started giving out orders and organizing the group into two lines of 12 people side by side. It was time to get started. Welcome to Reaper Island, General Holman said as he slowly paced in front of the group. In case you weren't paying attention back in the mainland, too focused on useless gossip, I'll reintroduce myself. My name is General Harrison Holman. I'm in charge of the exploration mission of Reaper Island, which means that all of you are my responsibility. I have a duty to lead you through this mission and safely bring you back to the colony. It also means that all of you are prepared to listen to my orders and follow through with everything I say. This isn't a game, and this isn't whatever kind of bedtime story you heard back home. This is an island unlike any other. Understood? 
The crowd replied with varying grades of enthusiasm to his words, but it was clear their interest was growing. I'm at the head of this operation, and I guarantee you I'll be too busy to reassure all of you whenever you're spooked by a shadow in the trees. Unless it's an extreme emergency, you should address your concerns to my second in command, Captain Harper Miranda. We are accompanied by four scientists, Mara Magna specialists, that will be responsible for studying, identifying, and understanding the environment we find ourselves in. Seven of you are soldiers from Earth or Mara Magna colonies, trained and equipped to keep us safe from any threats, hunt if necessary, and maintain the peace in the group. Finally, Twelve of you have just arrived from Earth. I understand you haven't had time to adapt. You didn't choose this path. And some of you aren't even volunteers. But whatever you were on Earth, you can leave it there. Right now, all that matters is that I consider you as members of my team in this mission. You are all equals, and you will be treated as such. You will respect me and your peers. You will obey orders, and you won't bring me any trouble. In exchange, when we return to the colony, you'll have earned yourself a safe place in this world. Your job is to help carry the scientific equipment, tools, and resources, and of course, attentively observe the environment of the island. After the mission is over, everyone's testimony will be taken into consideration for the final evaluation of Reaper Island understood. This time, the crowd voiced their agreement a little more confidently and homogeneously. But if anyone made any move to break the order, the general cleared his throat as a warning to keep them in place. <clears throat> Lastly, some information about the island you're standing on. A selected few members of the team have maps with exact coordinates and details of the island. For the rest of you, Reaper Island has an area of approximately 136 square miles. Most of the coast looks just like what we see here. Deeper into the island, we'll face something close to tropical rainforest vegetation and fauna. But, considering none of us were alive when our old planet looked like this, we'll have to learn as we go. The exploratory robots identified diverse species of birds, insects, and small animals, but we don't have any information on possible bigger threats. We'll come across at least five small rivers, all of which we'll be able to avoid or cross on foot. Ideally, we would walk around the perimeter of the island, occasionally diving deeper for research, and eventually returning to this spot where we'll call for transport. Or they will return in three weeks, wait for us a week, and if we're not here yet, well, that's nothing to worry about. Under all his bravado, the general wasn't immune to the chill of fear at the prospect of perishing in Reaper Island. He cleared his throat and kept his head held high, but Hayden had noticed the telltale signs of doubt crossing his eyes. The general addressed his second in command. Captain, anything you'd like to add? Not me, General, Captain Miranda answered. It was a somewhat risky move because anyone distracted could have missed it, but most people could easily grasp the jab at Harrison withholding some information. Hayden watched the General clench his jaw, but finally conceded. I won't entertain ridiculous rumors about what happens on Reaper Island, he warned his group. But if any of you heard that I've been here before, it's true. I was part of an exploration mission a couple of years ago. However, I sustained a minor injury about halfway through. It was, however, serious enough to get me sent back home ahead of my team. They never returned. They were never found. I will use my previous knowledge of the island as much as I can to our advantage. But I decide what to share. You are not welcome to ask about that mission. If anyone has any questions about anything else, speak now. Otherwise, we'll get going immediately. We have to make the most out of daylight hours. Nobody dared to ask any questions. Hayden assumed they preferred to wait for the right time to approach the captain instead. So, after assigning every person a bag and imparting the most specific rules and instructions 
To keep up with the expedition and move in that setting, the group started moving. Part 4. Into Reaper Island. Rumors be damned, the first mile of Reaper Island turned out to be absolutely gorgeous. Much to General Holman's chagrin and haste, the group advanced slowly, because the scientists' first point of interest was the beach they had arrived at. Hayden and the other civilians worked as assistants and Captain Miranda supervised close by. She served as a mediator between the scientists and the rest of the group, explaining the results in terms they would understand. You might be familiar with some of the water components, such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, sodium, and chloride. The levels of all these things are different than on Earth, though. You could easily drink this water and experience about 10% of the negative consequences of what you would associate with salt water. Do you have any idea how beneficial that could be? How long these reserves of water could last? Harper stopped her explanation to pick up one of the tubes that the scientists filled with water. It was designed with a small screen on the front that after a minute or so, displayed the main components of the liquid it contained. Take a closer look though. There are more than those elements, of course, but there are also things we don't completely understand yet. Look, M92, GL gas, these are elements natural from this planet, and we think they're perfectly safe. But look at the smaller percentages. We haven't even begun to name all the things you can find in these waters. And the ocean is what we know best somehow the general added, coming closer to the group gathered on the coast. In the mainland, it's absolutely prohibited to go into any of the rivers before they are deemed safe. We have no idea what the rivers of this island in particular might show. It was a tactful reminder that they had to keep moving. There were many more things to study and observe. They couldn't get more than a couple of feet away, though. The group was stopped in its tracks by a whimper of fear. Oh, what the hell is that? Everyone turned around at the sound of Samantha's voice. She was pointing at the water and her hand was visibly shaking. Her distraught state was understandable. At first, it seemed that she was very much pointing at the human skull floating on the water. Choked gasps rippled through the group. The general and the soldiers rushed forward and everyone heard the guns click loaded. But at the first brush from the barrel of a gun, the alleged skull floating on the shore turned over, and the scientists exhaled, relieved. It's just an old version of these test tubes, Harper explained. They used to make these spherical versions, leaving them anchored in shallow waters to be retrieved hours or days later when the results of the test were done. A previous exploration team must have left them here. They, they never returned to pick up the results. As she spoke, the group watched, holding their breath as more and more metallic spheres resurfaced on the water. Maybe they resurfaced after the disturbance of their ship on the shore. Maybe they were there the entire time, and the more they looked, the more noticeable they became. One thing was for certain. There would have to be many more examples of failed explorations waiting for them on their path. Oh, this whole place is like a cemetery, isn't it? Samantha's comment wasn't well received by the general, who raised his voice and demanded, That's enough! We have to keep moving, now! There was no room for arguing. The group finally entered the depths of the island. Hayden and the refugees, volunteers, and ex-convicts from Earth watched curiously at the procedures and all the equipment used by the scientists. Harper explained it all patiently, almost amused. Air analyzers, she said, helping the scientists install a contraption made of several tall, thin tubes crowned by a nearly transparent flag. As you can see, we can breathe on this planet, but we aren't done learning all we can about it. Also, the particles in the air could tell us more information about this island than what we could see. Further into the island, Harper raised her voice to be heard over the thunder of a couple metallic boxes about one cubic foot in dimensions that were automatically drilling themselves into the ground of Reaper Island. And these are ground scanners! We must know these grounds as well as possible! Are they fertile? Are there toxic components underneath? What are the different layers? How does it all explain the existence of this island? Her excitement was soon snuffed out like a candle. 
when everyone heard one of the scientists gasp loudly and then proceed to turn away from the group to throw up leaning against a tree. General Holman leaned over the shoulder of a different scientist to take a look at the results on display on one of the box's screens. Human remains, he said quietly, just loud enough for the closest people to hear. Not too far from here, scattered all over, and quite a lot of them. The group's enthusiasm suffered a sudden death. Only Hayden was close enough to Samantha to hear her whisper, It's a fucking cemetery, I told you. Regardless of the bodies that they couldn't find, but their scanners could still somehow detect, the group had to go on and on. The scientists were equipped with glass containers of different shapes and sizes that they attached to the trunks and roots of trees, or where they deposited leaves and flowers they cut from every plant on the island. These collectors are essential to determine if Reaper Island is useful or inhabitable, Harper explained. They are going to answer questions like, are these plants edible? Are they toxic and how much? Are they located all over the planet or endemic to this island? Can we replicate them? Can we get rid of them if necessary? Do they have other uses? For medicine, for science, and how do they interact with each other? The captain's master class on scientific work was interrupted by the general, who couldn't disguise that something was troubling him. I have another question for you, Captain. He said. Why are these plants resistant to whatever threats hide in Reaper Island? Or are they responsible for the losses our army has suffered? Everyone that wasn't currently preoccupied, tending to the small machines they carried, turned towards him. What do you mean? Samantha asked him, and then immediately winced, knowing the question wasn't aimed at her, and fearing the general's temper. However, even just one day in Reaper Island started to blur the social limits within the group. With nothing more than a grunt, Harrison replied, Well, we all saw the old models of water testers on the shore, and we know there are human remains nearby, but why aren't there any other signs that people pass by here at all? The last exploration mission happened only a couple of months ago. How come every sign of human life just disappeared? As everyone processed his words and the bad omen they carried, a harsh breeze passed by rustling the leaves of the trees and making everyone repress a shiver. Captain Miranda looked quite reluctant to ask this in front of everyone else, but she finally addressed the general. Do you remember? Did your team leave any marks on their way here? The general was quiet for some time, and people started to move on, fearing he wouldn't answer at all. But finally, he said, I can't be sure if this is the exact same path we walked. But we were far from the first exploration, and five more teams already came here while I recovered on the mainland. Five steps along the shore showed us proof that other people came here. But a full day of walking and the best we got is a vague reading on the scanners? There's, there's something wrong here, and we better make it our mission to figure it out before, before we return home. Or before it erased all traces of them from the island too. Harrison might have not said it out loud, but everyone else was able to fill in the blanks in their minds. If only to distract the team from the invisible threats looming over their heads, General Holman announced that, according to the map generated by the exploratory robots that preceded human exploration on the island, there would be a clearing nearby, ideal for spending their first night on Reaper Island. The general, the captain, one of the soldiers, and the head scientist held a meeting for a long time, away from the rest of the group. Hayden wasn't able to find a way to move close enough to eavesdrop and further confirm his suspicions that the general was hiding something. He tried to entertain himself and learn more about his current circumstances by studying the rest of his company, but he wasn't particularly successful. The soldiers, except for the ones that were assigned the first guard of the night, fell asleep almost immediately, knowing that it was best to make the most of every second of rest wherever they went. The rest of the scientists seemed too fascinated by the results they could read on the screens they carried with them everywhere, and Hayden wouldn't have been surprised if at least one of them didn't even sleep the whole night. The civilians laid down to sleep, yet most of them were struggling to fall asleep surrounded by the distractions of Reaper Island. Leaves rustling in the wind, unknown insects chirping all around, 
animals that they couldn't even imagine lurking in the shadows, breaking twigs and occasionally growling in the distance. He had a feeling none of them were volunteers from Earth. The people in charge of Mara Magna's migration wouldn't have sent them on a doomed mission. But even ex-convicts and refugees were difficult to differentiate. Were they excited to be there because it was the freedom they longed for, or because it was something better and different than Earth? Alternatively, were they nervous and sullen because they didn't trust anyone any longer, or because they weren't at the hopeful new home they were promised? Hayden could have let it go, waiting for a chance to pry information from someone new, but he reluctantly accepted that he already had a bond with one member of the team, and she wasn't the worst source of information around. Samantha, are you still awake? He inquired quietly, moving just slightly closer to the spot where she had placed her sleeping bag. Yeah, I can't sleep in this world. The woman grumbled. Everything is so... How can it feel so much wilder and simultaneously more peaceful than Earth? Nothing stands still here. I swear, even the ground feels unsteady, and the clean air keeps fluttering in my lungs as if I had inhaled alien bugs or something like that. Hayden felt tempted to laugh fondly, but it wasn't the right time and place. He wasn't the right person for that. After clearing his throat, he told her, I need you to tell me everything you've heard about this place. It looked like the night had brought with itself a sense of dread in Samantha. She didn't jump at the chance to discuss everything she had heard about Reaper Island. She shrugged half-heartedly and admitted, I don't know anything. Not really. The rumors, then. Anything you've heard might be useful, Hayden insisted. Nothing has ever been confirmed, Hayden, Samantha said quietly. People say that every time it's the same. They send soldiers to several islands and across the mainland. Every team but the one for Reaper Island returns. But there's never an explanation. They just... disappear. People talk, but in the end, nobody knows if what got the soldiers was some kind of monster, something supernatural, a government secret, anything they can come up with. Not all of us are soldiers, though, Hayden pointed out. Samantha smiled sadly at him and asked, Why do you think that is? They're running out of willing participants for this suicide mission. So, we're cannon fodder. Great. Hayden groaned. Suddenly, many things about this mission made sense. But, most importantly, it turned him even more determined to make it out alive. Holman is really the only person that's ever been on this island before then, Hayden asked. Then, after a nod from Samantha, he continued. And he never said what was so horrible about this place. I don't think he got to see the worst of it. He had a foot fracture, and the worst he ever experienced was returning to the coast with a friend's help and then going to the mainland alone. Samantha made a pause, and Hayden was just about to come up with new questions, maybe about the captain, maybe about the rest of the team. But Samantha's eyes suddenly lit up. You know what else I can tell you? There's something about the general. The last time he was here, the person in charge of the mission was his sister. She was the one that ordered him to go back home when he got hurt. He left her behind, and she never returned. Apparently, everyone in Mara Magna always thought he'd go back to find her eventually. And, well, here we are. It was the final piece of the puzzle for Hayden. For the leaders on the mainland, this mission was a routine, a necessary sacrifice. For the general, this was a search and rescue mission. He cared about only one person, who only he believed to still be alive. Nobody really cared about keeping the rest of the team alive. All at once, it became Hayden's new mission. He couldn't care less about exploring that infamous island. His new goal was to get as many of his team alive back to the shore as soon as possible. Part 5. Time to Escape After the thrill and trauma of abandoning planet Earth, after learning their fate and the dark reputation of Reaper Island, Hayden and most of the team were shocked to find out that the next few days went by with surprising ease. At first, everything they saw, every result on the scanner, every sight and every sound was extraordinary. Everything about Reaper Island was new and exciting and often intimidating. However, not even the worst reputation in the universe could change the fact that it was a relatively small island 
that most of the plants and living creatures had already been identified in the mainland, and that doing nothing but walk all day and wait for scientists to set up their small instruments and machines turned quite boring fast. Three remarkable things prepared the team for a twist in their mission. First, one of them got sick. No one knew what exactly happened to have him throwing up, riding a violent fever. He didn't admit to breaking any regulations. The team discussed the idea of sending him back to the shore and calling an emergency ship that would take him to a decent hospital. However, there was a noticeable reluctance in everybody around him. It was a bad omen, the reminder that something similar had happened to Harrison and the rest of his team never returned home was too much to ignore. Even when the poor man slowly started to get better, everyone was already growing superstitious. It didn't help that the next day the group reached a new river, the second surprise. They had walked past a handful of small creeks and only one significant river that was barely shallow enough for them to cross, which they managed thanks to Harrison's previous knowledge of it. However, the second one was different. The general hadn't encountered it on his first expedition. The scientists started to run their tests as eagerly as usual, but they were promptly interrupted. The head scientist dropped the first sample they collected. The container shattered on the ground. The water splashed over their feet, and the scientist ushered everyone away from the river immediately. What happened? Captain, what happened? Samantha asked, trying and failing to keep her own voice down. Captain Miranda gave her a sign to wait for news and stayed by the general's side as they awaited explanations from the scientists. When only the general was needed there, the captain returned to the civilians to share the developments. Sediments, she explained, though she didn't look too sure of her own words. The river carries an absurd number of sediments, and Harper, be honest. Samantha pleaded with her. Fine, look. The water turned fucking red when they put it on the containers. Some of the natural minerals in Mara Magna's waters get easily stained when combined with other substances. You think this river looks brown and dirty, but upon a closer look, it was tainted red. These waters came in contact with human blood. The sediments carry traces of human remains. The bodies! Samantha gasped. The bodies of the people that got lost on this island. We haven't found anybody yet, which is very strange, right? This means they must have been close to this river. Before anyone else could confirm or deny Samantha's theory, the general spoke up. That's absolutely right. Harrison said with a vigor no one had heard from him yet. We're on the right track, finally. If we follow the river, we'll find something that will guide us to the others. There must be an answer in the headwaters of the river. If no one had stopped him, Harrison might have run along the river the entire night. However, Captain Miranda boldly stepped forward and said, General, I'm under the obligation to remind you that this is an exploration mission and not a missing person search. Her courage took everyone by surprise, everyone but Hayden, who suspected even this disagreement had been planned by the two people in charge of the expedition. You're right. The general nodded, taking a good look at his team and at the sun setting down swiftly on the horizon. We can camp here for the night, and we'll follow our scheduled route tomorrow. We should get to the mountain around noon. The group followed instructions, and by then, everyone had gotten used to the nighttime routine of camping on Reaper Island. However, all of them could feel tension in the air. Something was waiting for them. That night, Hayden fell asleep right away, but had an uneasy sleep. And when he was abruptly woken up, he was almost grateful, until the pieces of the unfortunate puzzle of that night started to make sense. Hayden, Hayden, wake up. Please wake up. Samantha's nervous voice roused him from his sleeping bag, but everything was still dark. It was the middle of the night. He was groggy and sleepy, and everything looked blurry. Hayden, do you know how to shoot a gun? What the hell, Samantha? Hayden thought he heard someone briefly laugh, but when he moved up to his feet, squinting at the light of a handful of flashlights in the hands of everyone already awake, he found a silhouette standing in front of him, holding out a gun. There's no time. Hayden, 
Captain Miranda said. The general took off in the middle of the night with two of the soldiers. He's desperately looking for someone that most certainly died here years ago. Shortly after, the soldiers on guard detected a threat nearby. One of the native beasts from Mare Magna. The problem is, three soldiers went to deal with it, and they haven't returned. According to the scientist scanners, there might be two more beasts nearby. And not only am I starting to lose faith in those little machines, I have only two armed soldiers left. So, can you handle a gun? Hayden ran his hands over his face one last time, trying to gather his strength, his focus, and prepare himself for the worst that Reaper Island could throw at him. I do. I got this, he replied. Seriously? Samantha said. She eyed the gun suspiciously while Harper explained the slight difference between that modern Mara Magna model of a rifle and the guns that Hayden used to handle on Earth. I was a mercenary back on Earth, Hayden explained, getting acquainted with his new weapon and suppressing a shiver when he heard the enemy growling somewhere in the darkness that surrounded them. Samantha gasped. I thought you were a refugee like me. Ex-convict, really. Harper interrupted them sharply. We don't have time for this. It was as if her voice became a curse. Just then, the ground started to shake underneath their feet. It started as an almost unremarkable tremor. Most people reached out towards the trees to steady themselves, and the people in charge of the guns prepared for a surprise attack from the predators. However, a question from Samantha changed the course of what could have been a familiar, natural phenomenon and became a great catastrophe. Was the ground this muddy when we fell asleep? Her question made everyone look down and discover that their shoes were halfway submerged in thick mud that covered the ground, which they were certain had been dry and thick some hours ago. On a whim, Captain Miranda stepped towards the scientists, who were huddled in the ground, careless of the mud as they lost their minds staring at the ground scanners. Harper snatched one of those tools from a man's hand and frowned at the results on the screen. This doesn't show any of these changes at all! Shit! This is useless. We've got the water right, but we don't have a clue of what ground we're walking on! The captain snapped. She threw the device at the ground and stomped forward. She didn't look behind her to see that the instrument didn't crack on the ground as she'd probably expected. Instead, it started to sink down in the mud. And it wasn't the only one. After only a few steps, Harper was starting to get stuck. And no matter how much she fought it, the mud was already covering her feet completely. The ground of the island was completely transformed. The layer of mud was growing at a breakneck pace, as if some dark liquid was springing from the cracks on the earth, or so it seemed. The remaining soldiers moved toward the trees, looking for leverage from this suddenly transformed terrain. The scientists remained frantically looking for answers. Samantha let go of her own safe spot to help Harper move forward. The problem was that the momentum of getting the captain unstuck sent the two of them stumbling down to the ground. Hayden rushed forward to help them before the mud could cover them much faster, but he wasn't fast enough to avoid a new onslaught of bad news. A shrill scream from Samantha broke through the already disturbed night. Everyone turned towards her. A skull! She yelled. This time it's real. Oh shit, it's real! Unfortunately, she was absolutely right. The more the mud increased around them, it became obvious that it was dragging up all sorts of remnants from previous explorations. Hayden helped the two women back on their feet, and as they moved toward the trees, they were able to catch sight of bones, unfamiliar scientific tools, and then even entire bags that belonged to soldiers long gone. That unsteady cemetery made up for a disturbing sight under the light of the moon and the trembling flashlights that only some of them were still holding on to. What the hell is going on out here? Hayden asked as he prepared his gun again. He wasn't sure if the ground was still shaking or if it was an effect of the layer of mud swallowing down everything on its path. It had reached his shins before he managed to climb on the nearest tree. Uh, some natural 
natural phenomenon we definitely were not aware of. Harper answered as she helped Samantha climb a different tree. The layers of the ground interact with each other. Maybe a regeneration process? Cleaning the surface, dragging down the threats? Samantha scoffed. Yeah, well, it's messed up, but it's not so deadly, is it? We might be okay if we stay in the trees. How come this hasn't left any survivors? Hayden closed his eyes for a moment to think. When he lived on Earth, he learned some of the worst skills a person could learn. He learned how to hunt down his own kind for a bounty. He was a hunter, and he remembered how to think like one. We are invaders, newcomers caught by surprise, he said, loud enough to be heard by the remaining members of his team. But the natural predators on this island must be familiar with this reoccurring phenomenon. This is more than its own threat. This is a natural trap. Hayden's ominous words made everyone exchange looks. Samantha, Harper, the other soldiers, and most of the civilians were sitting on the lowest branches of the trees. But somehow, the scientists had not caught on to the danger they were in, or they were purposefully ignoring it. The group scrambled to get their attention. Hey, all of you, get up, now, it's an order. Come on, what the hell are you doing? Oh, please, get up. Run! Forget the fucking experiments! What's it worth if you all die? Come on! Oh my god, what is that? Samantha's exclamation made everyone wave their flashlights around for the source of her distress. They were horrified to find what they were looking for. It's the... The creature that soldiers went to kill! Harper, I don't think the soldiers succeeded. At the moment, no one could see the actual body of the creature, seeing as it was almost entirely submerged. However, it would have been impossible to miss the thick, sharp, numerous bone-like antlers that gleamed under the flashlights. They moved slowly but steadily above the mud while the creature they belonged to slithered underneath the surface. The group's yells intensified. Two of the scientists tried to stand up, the mud was well above their knees and made it impossible to move. One of them fought against the mud as if swimming in a disturbingly thick river, and one of them ignored absolutely everything around him in order to keep frantically working against the screens on his dirty and doomed little tools. After a few seconds that lasted like an eternity, a deep growl announced the inevitable end. The creature took a leap out of the mud, through the air, and landed with its open jaws right over one of the scientists, snapping its fangs on him, splattering the others with his blood, and dragging him down. Its immense body, at least twice the dimensions of a crocodile from Earth, disappeared under the surface for a moment, just long enough to pull down another scientist who screamed louder and more desperate than anyone else had ever heard from a person before. Did you see how high that monster can jump? We are so doomed! Samantha broke the deadly silence to ask. She was crying, shaking, assuming it was the end already. However, Hayden didn't quite agree with her. All the odds were against them. There was the captain, two soldiers, and only a couple civilians that knew how to handle a gun. They were fighting an entire island and an unfamiliar planet, and at least one creature that was more terrible than anything they had ever seen on their home planet. But Hayden was a hunter. He was a survivor. And all he wanted was to make it out of Reaper Island alive. And he was determined to fight until the very end for it. Hey, sci-fi horror fans, it's John. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this story, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Thank you to all our official supporters of the channel. Craving another scary story? Click on that video on your screen. Until next time, everyone, and remember, stay cosmic.